Reconstructionist Radio presents a War Room production. The Post No Report with Nathan F. Conkey. Hello and welcome to the 34th. 3434, can you believe it? 34th edition of the Post Mill Report with Mr. Nathan Conkey. Uh, thank you for listening. Now, I want to talk this week about Asher's Bakery and the five points of success and failure I had. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked about three keys to getting nowhere and doing nothing in your Christian life. Now, I'm recording this in light of the recent ruling on the Asher's case, the Asher's Bakery Gay Cake issue. I wanted to extend the three points that I talked to to five and talk about Christian culture, not just our individual Christian lives, as important as they are. So, just to preface, I am not a lawyer, I have no legal expertise, and I'm not going to make comments on how to win a court kiss in the UK, in Northern Ireland today. And also I want to state that I have no beef with the family involved. In fact, they deserve recognition as they, on record, oppose the introduction of same-sex marriage as they believe that it is contrary to God's law. That's in the official court report. And he called his business a Christian business when responding to this character, Gareth, who uh, was part of the sting operation against the business. And theirs is clearly more than just a church religion. To quote the report again, in their eyes, it would have been sinful for them to complete the order. Now, I want to focus on Christian culture and what is Christian culture but the Christian religion externalized? So specifically, it's success and failure. How did you succeed as a Christian culture? And how, in this case, do you feel? Now, Northern Ireland is a great microcosm. It has its fundamentalists, its middle-of-the-road evangelicals, its neo-evangelicals, its reformed Presbyterian, reformed Baptist, evangelical Presbyterian, and a very Northern Irish megachurch too. So I want to riff off the lost case and ask questions about a losing Christian culture. For example, why on earth is the Northern Irish church losing? And importantly, how can we, Northern Irish Christian culture, and other Christian cultures, how can we win? Now, how is this relevant to the post-mill report, you might ask? Now, our Great Commission task is a mandate to disciple the nations, not just individuals. And I'm going to use five categories to examine the case. Theos, that is, um, transcendence, who's in charge. Hierarchy, to whom do I report. Ethics, what's right, what's wrong. Oaths or sanctions. That is, what happens if I obey? What happens if I disobey? And lastly, succession. Does this outfit have a future? So, quickly to number one, who's in charge? Well, it all boils down to, is Jesus king in a meaningful political manner? Does he have power on earth? And can he bring positive and negative sanctions to bear? We could also talk in this theme about the fear of the state and the fear of God. Either we fear the state or we fear God, but we can't have it both ways. This again is a battle of gods. It's a battle between Christ the king and the beast state with Satan as its power behind the throne. And we must emphasize that in this battle, as everywhere else, there is no neutrality. Either we are for Christ the king or against him. Either we are self-consciously following King Jesus or we are screaming be it ever so softly and respectably and in good order, we will not have this man to reign over us. A lot of times we go straight to the religious liberty argument and we must say that in terms of who is God, we must say that the religious liberty argument is invalid. Our charter of religious liberty is no other gods before me. Religious liberty, as it's understood today, assumes the equality of gods and the effective divinization of the state as the arbiter between the gods, just like it was in the Roman Senate when the senators decided who was a god and who wasn't. And yet the state pretends to be neutral. While pretending to be neutral, it is 
also pretending to exercise the power of a god. This state has assumed the power to make money out of nothing, creation ex nihilo, as we see with our Northern Bank notes and Ulster Bank notes and so on. The state claims the power to remake men and sanctify men in the prison system of Northern Ireland. It regenerates areas by stolen money, providing peace through its political agents, the police. So even in little Northern Ireland, we Northern Ireland, as we affectionately call it, the state is pretending to be a god, how pathetic. And again, uh, we must ask ourselves, when we're talking about transcendence, who is the ultimate authority, how many evangelicals in Northern Ireland recently voted for the European Union? The European Union, which has bought us this equality legislation, which has been such a weapon in the hands of the homosexual activists. The only way to win as regards transcendence is to have Christ as our Lord, as our only supreme political leader, whom we fear and obey. This means letting go of our fear of the state and our hope in the state to bring justice and earthly blessings. Number two, hierarchy. To whom do I report? We've been trained to think of our Christianity in individual terms, but Christianity is incurably covenantal. God is at the top, totally holy, but he employs representatives with limited and derived authority and equal responsibility in the civil, familial and church order. Those with greatest authority have the greatest responsibility and with that in mind, we must remember that pastors are there to equip the saints, Ephesians 4.2, and they are accountable to God for this responsibility. But what have we got from the clergy in Northern Ireland and elsewhere? The mantra that religion and politics don't mix. The constant refrain of the Romans 13 Brigade that we must above all else submit to the state and obey the state. And by the way, the law of God is barbaric, self-contradictory, unspiritual, carnal, only for the unbeliever, etc, etc, etc. They have, that is the clergy, long ago surrendered to the beast. As far back as the 1830s, the clergy gave away their birthright, the institutions dedicated to Christ and his kingdom, that is, Christian or denominational schools, at the suggestion of the radicals, the atheists and the apostates of the time. And boy, do they love it that way. Now, the Free Presbyterians and their sister organisation, we might say, the Democratic Unionist Party, they are not for this mantra that religion and politics don't mix. They in practice, however, sadly, are fundamentalistic and antinomian moralists who in the political realm act autonomously. They chain up swings on Sundays, oppose gay marriage, which is great, but there is no word of bringing back the king, King Jesus that is, and his law world. Well, how do we win in this battle for hierarchy? We win by recourse to a greater political power through our representatives, and we place ourselves and our institutions under the jurisdiction of King Jesus and his law word. Our powers, however, of government, that is governing ourselves, governing the institutions of welfare and education that we once had, have atrophied. And it is our fault for following leaders who, having abandoned the Lordship of Christ in principle and in practice, so what do we need to do? We need to begin retraining, reading, and learning what God requires of us, exercising government over ourselves, educating our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that is creating Christian schools and homeschools, and rebuilding the institutions of Christian government, that is uh, health, welfare, education, law courts, and more. Now, if we say this is unrealistic, we admit, we betray our belief in the ultimacy of the state rather than the ultimacy of God. We have been following Christian leaders who have forgotten their Lord. We must therefore govern ourselves as we are able. Number three, what are the rules? Ethics is or are clearly at the centre. Daniel MacArthur clearly pointed this out. The issue was the law of God. but. 
Why this narrow focus on sexuality only? And why the double standard? Daniel, a good man no doubt, echoing the sentiments of so many other evangelical Christians in Northern Ireland and beyond, appealed to the ethics of a rival religion, democracy. In reaction to the ruling, he said, this ruling undermines democratic freedom, religious freedom and freedom of speech. Our laws in Northern Ireland were and are more or less just. For example, it was only in 1985 that homosexual acts between consenting adult males were decriminalised. And thanks to the DUP in large part, there is no provision for same-sex marriage in the law of Northern Ireland. The problem is, again, that those who are politically active deny the relevance of the law of God in practice and in principle. The problem is, again, that Christian leaders hate and disdain the law of God, especially as it rivals and challenges the God of the state and its ethical standard. Again, the Romans 13 Brigade are indignant if you don't obey the state. But the least appeal to the law of God outside the narrowly prescribed jurisdiction of Christ in one or two aspects of the church and a couple of areas of personal morality and you are a dangerous Judaizer and will be treated with severity. Now, even those micro-denominations which make rhetorical appeal to the covenant of God who have blue banners to that effect in the corners of the churches govern themselves in practice by the ethics of their own choosing, very sadly. The game that the state is playing and the churches too, and churchgoers also, is to insist that religion and politics are somehow separate and even opposite. Religion, as the narrative goes, is the realm of faith, and faith is something mystical, something of the other world. It is the noumenal realm of Kant. It can be given a limited toleration based on the democratic principle. Many people believe this, so we have to give it some sort of respect. But the realm of justice is politics, the state. The evangelical commitment to political correctness was uh, recently demonstrated ably by the largest Protestant church's publication of a gender-neutral hymn book, Puke on My Shoes. Politics, the state, the beast, is the arbiter of right and wrong. By accepting this in principle and practice, this Romans 13ism, this antinomianism, and this all-round statism and worship of the beast, we as a Christian community have no king but Caesar, or expressed ethically, we have no law but Caesar's laws in the phenomenological realm, to use the scheme of Kant. But ethics are inescapably religious and political. The saviour of Israel from Pharaoh then gave him his law. The sovereign of a society is the lawgiver of the society. The sovereignty of God is rhetorically waved about, like Jews wave the scrolls about, or a witch doctor waves his fetishes about. But there is no preaching on how to apply God's word to every area of life. Ethically speaking, for evangelicals, Jehovah is uh, its a local God, a spirit with extremely limited jurisdiction, at least compared to the state. So how do we win in the realm of ethics? by a genuine turning to Christ in faith as our saviour from sins and our absolute Lord to whom all authority has been given in heaven and on earth and by worshipping, that is, serving him in the beauty of holiness, that is, obedience to his commandments in church, family, state, health, welfare, education and all things else. Number four, sanctions. What happens if I obey? What happens if I disobey? So, why are we so defeated in our Northern Ireland culture? We have to take into account the reality of God's sanctions, as specifically described in Deuteronomy 28. The sanctions of the covenant are directed first and foremost against covenant members, those who have the law word of God. Judgment begins at the house of God. Hear the words of God in Deuteronomy 28. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Very relevant given the bakery's location, albeit that business is booming. And we must emphasise, even though it's so ridiculous, defeat is not a blessing. A millennials to the contrary. 
Deuteronomy 28, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. We are defeated because of our disobedience, our rejection of the principle of the covenant. Again, in Deuteronomy, your sons and daughters shall be given to another people and your eyes shall look and feel with longing for them all day long. But who brought this accusation against the bakery? Who was responsible for planning this sting operation? Who was responsible for the unjust judgment? Who helped repeal the just laws against sodomy? Was it not the children of the church? The Turks used to kidnap Christian children and indoctrinate them in Islam for a decade or more, only to turn and use them as weapons against their own families and people. How horrible, how perverse. But how much more perverse when Christian parents give their children willingly over to be indoctrinated in a worse, even more anti-Christian religion, secular humanism. How much worse when clergymen sit on the boards of these schools, teach in these humanistic indoctrination centers and send their children and their wives to teach in them. How much more hypocritical when the revised curriculum for Northern Ireland openly and very clearly requires that children be taught the ethics of sodomy as being equal with whatever other expression of sexuality you might embrace and go so far as to state that the good child is the one who is an apologist for such evil lifestyles. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. How can God not judge such cursed activity? Again in Deuteronomy 28, the Lord will give you a trembling heart feeling eyes and anguish of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear night and day and have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, Oh, that it were evening. And at evening you shall say, Oh, that it were morning because of the fear which terrifies your heart and because of the sight which your eyes see. This is Northern Ireland today. This is the fleeing Christian culture. This is the refrain of the personally pious church goer who is terrified at what he sees around him. So how do we turn and win? We win by changing our minds. Let's talk about sectarianism. Sectarianism is the oft-touted source of all the evils in Northern Ireland. Sectarianism lies at the centre of how we see ourselves. We, by our adherence to Protestantism and Evangelicalism, whatever that is, are in the right. We are in line for spiritual blessings. If we are cursed and defeated, well, that is the work of the devil. We are the people of God. We have the Bible. We go to church. We adhere to several reformed abstract doctrines. But this narrative has to change if we are ever to win. This sectarianism must change covenantally, biblically. If we are cursed and defeated and thrown out and trodden under the feet of men, it is because we have defied God and have had contempt for his covenant and the covenant laws, we need to look at ourselves in the mirror, the mirror of God's word, the law word of God. We must look to God's gracious government for the merciful provision of repentance and the blessings that come with obedience. We must pray towards the high priest, Jesus Christ, that he would give us new hearts to obey him, that he would write the commands of his law on our hearts. And surely there is a remnant in Northern Ireland and elsewhere who by the power of God's Holy Spirit will be given the power to obey and trust. Number five, finally, does this outfit have a future? Succession. Northern Ireland evangelicals are going down the drain in terms of church attendance and influence and any other subjective or objective measure. And yet we had the political power. A Christian minister, Ian Paisley, was the first minister for the longest time, albeit with the alleged quartermaster of the IRA, a terrorist organisation, as his deputy first minister. We were and still are a substantial minority in Northern Ireland. Church-going people attending various shades of evangelical churches still make up a substantial minority. But this is being blown away from the centre Belfast to the periphery. But the democratic heresy is that numbers count. That's when we have a majority, we will win. Yet the Puritans dominated British life with only 4% at most of the population. And they reshaped the political landscape, the scientific outlook and turned the world upside down. As against this democratic heresy, 
that numbers only count is covenantalism, which alone gives us a true view of reality. If we break the covenant, a minuscule, effeminate, deviant group can kick us around at will. Deuteronomy 30 says, How could one man chase a thousand or two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them, unless the Lord had given them up? But if we keep the covenant, Joshua 23 says, One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised. The difference between defeat and failure is obedience to God and his covenant law. And these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. And they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder and on your descendants forever. The only path to success is repentance in terms of the covenant. The Bible says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We need to turn and repent as a people or we will be destroyed as a people and our land given to strangers who will do a better job of looking after the place and obeying God than we did. May God give us grace to be humble and obey him as a people and as individuals and to rebuild the ruins as Ezra and Nehemiah did. May God bless you in the upcoming week and thanks for tuning in. If you want to know more or would like to make a tax deductible donation, you can contact me through c10.org forward slash Nathan Conkey. Have a great week. Goodbye. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.